Degrassi. You've probably heard of it, or at least I'd be surprised if you haven't. Some remember it as a relatable, if slightly controversial, Canadian TV show from the 2000s. Others remember it simply as that show Drake was in. Uh, you'd both be right, but despite all the mounds of conversation that the show is likely to spark, it's actually going to be nothing more than a mere footnote for the topic at hand. Yeah, believe it or not, but Degrassi first began not in the early 2000s, but actually in 1979 with the kids of Degrassi Street. Tragically for that show, it too won't be mentioned much as it sadly is not considered canon in the DCU, Degrassi Cinematic Universe. Uh, no, the first phase, if you will, of canon Degrassi began in 1987 with Degrassi Junior High, which lasted for three seasons and then spawned a sequel show, Degrassi High which culminated in a 1992 film entitled Schools Out, a name inspired by the Alice Cooper song. For those of you that may have watched Degrassi The Next Generation, the Drake one, uh, you might just recognize a couple faces from this late 80s, early 90s relic as, surprise, surprise, The Next Generation focuses on a few characters that are either children of, or at least related to, the kids from the older show. In fact, a few of the original actors make appearances themselves often in the earlier seasons. However, I know what you're thinking. What exactly makes this little show a <clears throat> forlorn masterpiece? Uh, well, before we get to the fun part, let's embark on a little journey to the 80s and take a gander at the cultural and political environment that spawned Degrassi and its many stories. Welcome to 1987. It's 1987, and Canada is reveling in its post-Trudeau glory. Pierre Trudeau unified the French separatists with the rest of the country, upholding the proud Canadian ideals of unity and multiculturalism. Wow! Canada is also on the cusp of holding the first international climate change summit that would directly lead to the Kyoto Protocols. Hey Canada, way to go! Even corporations and scientists were getting behind the Canadian government's search for a solution to environmental issues, such as the acid rain and the ozone. Jeez! The economic crash of the 70s? What's that? Behind Trudeau's policies, Canada's natural resources brought about an unprecedented amount of economic growth. Oh gosh, wowee! Let's take a trip south to Canada's old big brother, eh? The late 80s and early 90s displayed the U.S.'s cultural dominance over the global landscape. Movies got bigger and better. Sports stars began to launch ad campaigns for sneakers lasting longer than television seasons. Reagan's reign over the West brought about an excitement for American culture not seen since Elvis in his blue suede shoes. Between the muscle cars, sports stars, and cocaine-fueled platinum records, the kingmakers of America must have felt on top of the world. So, it's about time we get to the actual show, huh? Well, instead of recapping it, if you'd like to watch Degrassi High and Junior High, the entire series is free on YouTube from the official Degrassi channel. I'm going to tell you about a select few characters, seven of them to be specific. Now, in the earlier version of the show, Degrassi Junior High, you'd be hard-pressed to find a main character. In fact, on my first watch of the show, I was sort of dumbfounded by the fact that there weren't any really quote-unquote main characters. Each episode seems to focus on a different person that you previously thought was just an extra in the background from a previous episode, which, by the way, is really dang cool and borderline experimental for a kid's show from the 80s. However, as Degrassi went on, and especially when it evolved into its high school format, the main characters became much more clear. But the person the show focuses the most on overall is Joey Jeremiah, resident class clown and aspiring keyboardist for his band The Zits, also referred to as The Zit Remedy. And that's whose story we're going to be looking at first. While being the closest thing to a main character the show has, in Joey's first season he plays a more villainous role, stuffing Arthur into a locker in the first episode. Much of his story revolves around a short-lived crush on school president Stephanie Kay. But soon the smooth-talking lead singer of The Zit Remedy finds himself getting in a lot of trouble. Everything from stolen car hijinks to getting in fights with the school bully Dwayne. But the season reaches a disappointing end when he finds out he has to repeat the 8th grade. The next school year, Joey's best friend Wheels loses his parents after a car accident, causing a rift between the two. While trying to mend his friendship with Wheels, he also winds up falling for Caitlin, one of the more well-behaved, smarter students of the grade. 
While Joey continuously bungles his chances with Caitlyn, his friendship with Wheels is repaired for the most part as the Zit Remedy are reunited. Joey and Caitlyn begin officially dating by the end of the third season, but after a promising start, they break up not long into high school as they have trouble finding much in common. However, despite Caitlyn finding a new boyfriend soon after the breakup, Joey never gets over her. Later, he finds out he has dysgraphia, a neurological disorder that impairs writing ability and fine motor skills, which doesn't help Dwayne's constant bullying. Joey soon has to get tutored by Caitlyn, and through these tutoring sessions, they become friends again. But Joey finds out during a fight with Dwayne that the bully is HIV positive, and despite being arch enemies, Joey agrees not to tell anyone. Joey Snake and Wheels rename the Zit Remedy to The Zits, and make a music video with the help of Lucy for their signature song, Everybody Wants Something. Later, Joey and Caitlin finally admit their true feelings once again, and they go to prom together. While at prom, Joey sees Dwayne in the bathroom, hiding from the rest of the school as, unsurprisingly, his secret was revealed, and now the whole school knows he's HIV positive. Despite their violent past and hating each other throughout the entire series, Joey comforts Dwayne and tells him to go back out on the dance floor with his friends and to not worry what people think. Now, as far as his role in the School's Out movie is concerned, we'll save that for later. But... Our next character is... Vula, or Vula Gr uh, Gr uh, <laughs> I think I'll pass on trying to pronounce that, but she's a very interesting character. Vula's basic persona is that of an incredibly smart, independent, and responsible young woman who finds herself hanging with people that her parents view as the wrong crowd. The show begins with Vula working as campaign manager for best friend Stephanie Kay. However, the friendship falls apart when Steph wins as she never thanks Vula even though she did essentially all the work. Luckily for Steph, Vula steps in for her when she gets too drunk to give a speech at the school dance, but she's punished as her father sees her despite specifically restricting her from attending. She later befriends Lucy and helps her get better grades, but her new friend proves to be a bad influence when she pressures Vula to shoplift and they're caught by mall security. Vula's upset, but forgives Lucy when she admits that Vula did nothing wrong. Sadly, at the start of the second season, Vula, who may as well have been considered the main character of the show at this point, mysteriously moves away and is never seen again. Hashtag justice for Vula. However, her presence is felt in a permanent way for the rest of the show's run, spawning a new breed of character whom I affectionately refer to as the Vula clones. These are characters that bear striking resemblances to Vula, Everything from personality to heritage, but most importantly, they hold the same thematic purpose. Uh, more on that later. Unsurprisingly, Vula does not appear in Schools Out or any other Degrassi media. Once again, hashtag justice for Vula. Spike doesn't quite fall into any general tropey archetype as well as some of the other characters outside of being the punk kid, but that's just because of how she dresses. Despite being a background character for the majority of the first season, Spike comes to the forefront at the tail end as she has sex with a boy named Shane and ends up pregnant. After much discussion with her friends and her mother, she decides to keep the baby. Shane, however, wants her to get an abortion, but she refuses. Spike begins to take care of an egg baby in preparation for her incoming child, but Shane accidentally kills the poor egg. Spike decides to raise the baby on her own despite Shane's parents insisting that the baby be put up for adoption. She befriends new girl Liz, quickly becoming BFFs before she's kicked out of Degrassi by the parents and staff simply for being pregnant. At the end of the second season, she gives birth to Emma, who will later become a main character of the sequel show. Even though he's kept at a distance from Emma, Shane is determined to help, giving Spike child support payments weekly. Unfortunately, he winds up in a coma after taking some LSD. Without his financial help, Spike grapples with balancing school, money, and work as she struggles to find a job because of her punk appearance. Later, Shane finally awakes from his coma, having suffered some pretty severe brain damage, and Spike attempts to patch up their friendship to modest success. Spike then reveals a longtime crush she's had on Snake and works up the courage to ask him to prom, and he accepts. She's incredibly excited by this, as since she got pregnant, she hadn't really gotten out of the house or went to any school events. But sadly, she later overhears Snake telling a friend that he'd rather go to prom with local Vula clone Michelle. Hashtag justice for Vula. Depressed about the situation, Spike decides to tell Snake she's too busy to go to prom, freeing him up for Michelle. While Spike only makes a small appearance in Schools Out, the good news for her is that she becomes a series regular on the first several seasons of The Next Generation. Caitlin is the closest thing you'll find to a voice of reason type among the cast, but 
She's yet another character who doesn't find herself falling into a typical trope as much as the rest do. She begins the show as one of the more background characters. Uh, her first storyline involves a question of her sexuality due to some steamy dreams about her teacher. Later, Caitlin gets self-conscious about having epilepsy and stops taking her medication around her friends. This results in a seizure at her friend Susie's house. Kathleen, present at the seizure, begins spreading rumors about Caitlin at school. Later, she writes an article for the school paper about Spike's forced removal from the school because of her pregnancy, which angers Spike, as she never even talked to her for the article. She quickly develops a tumultuous relationship with class clown Joey Jeremiah Esquire while working on a class project together. Joey and Caitlin's first date goes well until she finds out that he asked her out on a bet, but in a display of commitment, he tears up the $20 bill. In high school, Caitlin and Joey's relationship is quickly on the rocks when Caitlin becomes infatuated with an older student named Claude due to their shared interests. Caitlin soon kisses Claude before breaking up with the confused Joey. However, Claude's true nature begins to show, as he abandons her after the police spot them vandalizing a factory, and she punches him in the face in response. Caitlin finds herself in detention as a result with none other than Joey Jeremiah, who disappointedly tells her about his newly discovered learning disability, but she comforts and assures him. Her ex, Claude, begins to pester her with cryptic remarks, and she rejects and ignores him up until the day he's found dead in the bathroom. When she returns home, she discovers flowers and a note preemptively sent from Claude, saying he forgives her for treating him so badly, and he'll always be thinking of her. She's haunted by this, feeling a dangerous mixture of guilt and anger, but once more she finds comfort in Joey as he assures her that she didn't act out of line with Claude as, despite the tragedy of his suicide, he was still awful to her. They end the final season attending prom together, again rekindling their relationship. And surprise, surprise, she's in school's out. Uh, a bunch. Kathleen is sort of the mean girl of the main group. She starts off as a background villain of the week kind of character. Her first arc on the show involves her and her best friend Melanie buying fake drugs from Joey. Once we reach the second season, kids around school begin to wonder why Kathleen is so rude and uptight all the time. Particularly Caitlin, who develops a sort of rivalry with Kathleen that centers around the school play, the academic decathlon, and their shared romantic interest, Rick. However, when Caitlin witnesses the relationship between Kathleen and her abusive, alcoholic mother, she tries to help, but Kathleen rejects her. Only Rick is able to break through to her, and she eventually calls a children's help group. Kathleen and Melanie's strong friendship is later put to the test. When Melanie discovers Kathleen's diary, and even more harrowing, she discovers evidence of an eating disorder. Kathleen refuses to talk to Melanie, feeling betrayed by her invasion of privacy. But after some time, their friendship is somewhat repaired as Kathleen goes full wingman for Melanie's pursuit of Snake. The next season, Kathleen starts dating an upperclassman named Scott. The relationship soon devolves into an escalating cycle of abuse, and every time he apologizes and showers her in gifts. And it eventually culminates in Scott throwing her to the ground and kicking her for disobeying him. She finally leaves Scott with Melanie's help, later putting a restraining order out on him. In the final season of the show, at a sleepover party for local Vula clone Diana, hashtag justice for Vula, they decide to smoke weed, with the exception of longtime rival Caitlin. Kathleen gets anxious and paranoid, while Melanie gets talkative and giggly, quickly revealing to the whole group Kathleen's traumatic relationships with both Scott and her mother, as well as her eating disorder history. Kathleen feels betrayed by Melanie once again and runs off. And... Of all people, Caitlin is the one to just sit and be with Kathleen, finally comforting and consoling her in one of her saddest moments. Kathleen does eventually forgive Melanie, but there's a newfound wariness present. Also, I regret to report to you that neither she nor Melanie appears in Schools Out at all. Although, she does appear in a small cameo in the very first season of The Next Generation. Here we got the two knuckleheads, the two jokesters. They're that duo you never see apart, at least at first. Arthur and Yick, two short, dorky boys, meet each other after Arthur is locked in a broom closet by Joey and freed by Yick, thus beginning the start of a whirlwind friendship lasting many seasons. Their dubious adventures include, but aren't limited to, a cheating debacle, basketball team tryouts, a smashed heirloom, adopting stray dogs, and sharing tips for a first crush that goes awry. Unfortunately, cracks start to form in their friendship when Arthur's mother wins the lottery, sparking disgust from Yick and a newfound interest in stocks from Arthur. 
They drift apart as Yik makes new friends and they find themselves slowly becoming opposites in both personality and social endeavors, reaching a climax in a final season that ostensibly benches the two as side characters. Arthur struggles to fit in with Yik's new friends, only able to earn respect from them in the form of hustling the group at poker night. Yik finds himself in a scandalous affair with a girl named Tessa, and they end up dating for the remainder of the season. Arthur and Yik's final interactions on the show end up being awkward glances that evoke a sense of yearning and tender nostalgia. Sadly, once again our two heroes do not appear in Schools Out. Yik, though, does make a cameo appearance in the first episode of The Next Generation. Oh gosh, uh, last but most certainly not least, we come to Wheels, the bad boy of the group. He easily falls into that traditional Lancer trope that often appears in sci-fi, fantasy, and anime genres. Think Han Solo, Vegeta, Bucky slash Winter Soldier, Spock, Sasuke, or Inigo Montoya. If you know any of those dudes, and I'm betting you do, imagine a Canadian high schooler version of that. Uh, uh, except Spock, I, I guess. He, he doesn't really, well, I'm, I'm not really a Star Trek kind of person oh um for you star trek fans out there is wheels the spock of degrassi <laughs> let me know uh anyway <clears throat> wheels begins the show going through an up and down relationship with stephanie k resulting in the boy buying condoms from none other than steph's mom oof the two lovebirds soon give up the chase zit remedy member snake points out to wheels that a man has been stalking him but he quickly discovers that the man is his birth father mike nelson the two share a nice evening getting to know one another. Later, Wheels walks in on a sub getting handsy with Lucy, a close friend, and he helps convince her to report him when they catch him with another student. Despite his parents' repeated complaints, Wheels continues to sneak out to band practice with Joey and Snake, and on one of these nights, Wheels returns home to find out that his parents were killed by a drunk driver. He ends up living with his grandmother, with whom he becomes more and more disrespectful towards. Blaming Joey for the loss of his parents, he quits the band and beats up his friend in the middle of the hallway. Later, he apologizes to Joey, and Joey forgives him, offering to let him spend Christmas with his family, which Wheels accepts. In a fit of frustration, he runs away to live with Mike. While hitchhiking to his father, he runs into a strange salesman, who tries to assault Wheels before he's able to get out of the car. When he finally finds Mike, the man turns him away and tells Wheels he isn't ready to take care of him. After making up, Joey, Wheels, and Snake decide to reform their band. Wheels' grandmother finally kicks him out after he lies to her about his grades. He stays with Joey's family for a while until they also kick him out when money starts to mysteriously go missing. After couch surfing for a bit and getting a job in an attempt to pay Joey's mother back, Wheels reaches an agreement with his grandmother to let him stay with her again. And, yeah, he does appear in Schools Out. Big time. Speaking of, we finished all the characters, so it's time to stop beating around the bush and talk about Schools Out. Now, I'm going to stop here for a moment and let you all know that I'm going to fully spoil the heck out of this movie, and that's because it goes pretty hog wild. I know I'm kind of biased because uh, obviously I like the show, but genuinely, this movie is probably the most depressing end to a TV show I've ever seen. Anyway, there was your warning. If you want to watch it, you can probably find it on YouTube. It's really not that hard. The film takes place a full year after the end of the final season of Degrassi High, right as the school year is about to end. Joey and Caitlin are still dating, with Caitlin set to graduate a year early and preparing to move away to university and room with Lucy. Joey decides to propose to her at a party, but Caitlin is taken aback by it and says no. Upset about it, Joey runs into a crestfallen Tessa. He drives her home, and they end up kissing. Later, she asks him out, and he hesitantly accepts. It doesn't take long until the two start regularly going on dates and having sex, something Caitlin and Joey haven't done yet. Tessa is warned by her manager Spike that Joey probably still has feelings for Caitlyn, but Tessa ignores her. Unfortunately for Tessa, Joey never breaks it off with Caitlyn and dates her in secret. By the middle of August, Tessa gets a shock, finding out that not only is she pregnant, but Joey never broke it off with Caitlyn. Soon after, she decides to dump Joey and get an abortion. Caitlyn is finally ready to have sex on Joey's birthday, but she ends up not having a very good time. However, a patient Joey comforts her. The next day, they go to a party with a bunch of their friends, including Wheels and Snake. During all of Joey's shenanigans, Wheels had been slowly drinking more and more every day while Snake worked as a lifeguard where he tried but failed to lose his virginity all the while Joey of course taunted him. In the middle of the party, Lucy and Wheels leave to go on a snack run and Joey and Snake talk alone. Snake gets fed up with Joey and loudly spills the beans about Tessa while Caitlin stands right behind him. Caitlin, furious, fires a signature line that will go down in history as Canadian TV's first F-bomb. You were fucking Tessa Campanelli? Um. 
not really though actually it was snake like right before that but nobody no nobody talks about it and i'm uh, anyway anyway um she then breaks up with joey but outside snake saves a girl from drowning he's surrounded by his friends as they call him a hero but he finds himself overwhelmed and breaks down while all that was happening, Wheels and Lucy's trip to the store ended in tragedy as an inebriated Wheels crashed into another car, which ended up paralyzing and blinding Lucy, as well as killing a two-year-old boy who was in the other car. Joey visits Wheels in jail and finds out that he's been charged and will likely be going to prison. Two months later, most of the Degrassi kids meet up for the wedding of Alexa and Simon, two side characters I never mentioned because they literally don't do anything. Um, Joey and Snake talk, and Joey meets Snake's girlfriend. Snake says he never wants to see Wheels again, while Joey apologizes for how he acted over the summer. Before he says goodbye to his friend, he leaves to talk to Caitlin. The two reminisce for a bit, and he apologizes for how he treated her. She accepts. The film ends as Joey and Caitlin dance one final time, with Joey noting that she'll be famous one day. That was a lot. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the ride, though, but now that you're all caught up on the juicy Degrassi lore, you can tell me how right I am about how absolutely depressing the series finale is. Jeez. Anywho, it's time we get to a little bit of discussion, a little bit of analysis. The best place to begin is with the Zit Remedy and their only song, Everybody Wants Something. Written by three middle schoolers, and it sounds like it, the song, oddly enough, sort of states the thesis of the show. Want is an essential part of living in the era, and adult life focuses on climbing the ladder without care for others. But in the end, there is hope for the kids to succeed, despite how cruel life can inevitably be. I'll throw the lyrics on the screen here. You can uh, pause the video if you'd like. You may have noticed <clears throat> the uh, axiomoronic nature of the piece. Uh, the line, everybody wants something, they'll take your money and never give up, portrays the world as cutthroat and swindle sappy an indifferent population that will step on whoever they can to get ahead of the curve, willing to let the bugs drown if it'll fill their tub. Despite the scathing critique of the band's surroundings, the last verse proclaims, you'll be somebody and you'll go far. Not exactly the follow-up you'd expect after such a frank chorus, but it's actually a perfect connect key for the show. All these characters see the cruel reality around them, and yet they still believe in the mythic rendering of their ability to wade through that reality. Each one has a unique story that builds into the Degrassi mythos and informs the themes of the Zit Remedy soul tune. With that being said, where better to begin than with the band's own Joey Jeremiah? Joey's dreams of being a rock star are ever-present throughout the entirety of the show, ebbing and flowing like any high school dream does, but it's easily one of the most memorable aspects of his character. However, his journey seems to be more about the slow acceptance of the death of that dream. After school is out, Joey appears as a major character in the first four seasons of The Next Generation, and is he a rock star? Or maybe an actor? Something to do with fame, right? No. He's a car salesman. And kind of slimy one at that. Of course he wasn't a rock star. Joey's final moments in the original show didn't have him proclaiming his future fame, but that of Caitlyn's. Beyond that, his band is done, with wheels in prison and Snake clearly having no interest. What else could Joey do? It was always a stretch for him to actually achieve that rock star dream, but how did he end up where he did? Sometimes life has a way of teaching us maybe the wrong lessons, and whether or not Joey learned one or two of those is up for debate, but his experiences in high school seem to humble his aspirations to an extreme degree. In between the 90s show and the next generation, he settled down and married, and had a daughter. And that's not a bad thing. He clearly finds solace in being a father and caretaker of both his daughter and stepson, and a pretty great one at that. But sadly, by the time the sequel show begins, his wife has passed away, and he once again finds himself craving a relationship. None of his many, which even include another on-off relationship with Caitlyn, seem to stick. Joey's a stubborn, starry-eyed kid who grew into a man more concerned with surviving in a world he didn't see coming. He's no longer telling you to be wary of everybody wanting something. He's taking your money. Vula's, and as an extension for the Vula clones arcs, mostly emphasize the fact that, hell, sometimes kids can be damn good people and even more responsible than their parents or teachers, despite the oppressive familial atmosphere they reside in. These characters are consistently shown to be mature and responsible, with perhaps a slight exception to Diana, but her lack of maturity and responsibility seems to come more out of an exhaustion for the ultra-conservative values forced upon her. However, despite these characters being 
the most adult of perhaps any of the kids on the show, their stories usually display their parents or guardians making mistakes, and displaying a distinct lack of trust for these unusually responsible kids. This is made most apparent with Michelle's story of moving out on her own, as, despite some hiccups, she shows a strong work ethic and an even stronger motivation to prove her father wrong. She learns the hard way that living on your own as a young adult, hell, as any kind of person, in a capitalistic culture is big tough, especially in regards to balancing work, school, and your checkbook. And this theme of adult mishandling children that is consistent throughout the stories of Bula and the Bula clones, hashtag justice for Bula, even pops up in the real life of Nikki Kemeny, the actress who plays Bula. The exact reason why she was only on the show for a single season, despite showing some of the best acting chops among the ensemble, is that her agent told her to hold out, demand a bigger role, more money, and as well wait for another project to pick her up. She did what her agent said, and what happened? She never appeared in another show or film ever again, and it was a decision she expressed great regret for. Once more, hashtag justice for Bula. Spike's story as a character has less clear-cut themes than some of the others. She, of course, is subject to the ever-present theme of adults being boneheads, just absolute narbos. Well, she herself is quite responsible, with the exception, of course, obviously being her pregnancy. Despite its overbearing nature, though, that mistake never defined her as she grew and matured more and more with every episode. Spike's most pivotal moment, despite all the hardship she went through, might just be her last major plot thread on the show, that being her brief single-episode romantic freefall with Snake. Through Spike's character, we see how difficult the life of a teen mother can be. And even in a moment where she finally finds a time to relax and smile for herself just this once, those hopes are dashed. She shows us an intense selflessness when she gives up her chance with Snake. Even throughout the entirety of Degrassi, we see so many tragedies that could easily be deemed worse than simply not being able to go to prom with your crush. But this moment somehow hits harder than most. And while she does eventually marry Snake in The Next Generation, where the original show leaves her is just so much stronger. She's a girl who lost her chance to experience a true teenage life. A girl who had to grow up fast. Caitlin's themes are interesting because the show's goals for her don't quite match up with her actual character development. Many of her plots repeat the same process. She becomes enraged by some modern cultural practice that she sees as a transgression, but by the end of the episode she learns that the world is complicated and sometimes you can't save everyone. Which is odd, to say the least. All these other characters push narratives that traditionally aren't seen often and especially emphasize how underestimated kids can be. For the character that gets maybe the most screen time of any, her lesson to be learned is a basic platitude that all old people say at some point. If it seems backwards, that's because it is. Through Caitlin's character, we see a virtuous young kid who can point out the hypocrisy of Western life. And despite these lessons she apparently learns, she's consistently mad at the world she's grown up in. Caitlin's true arc is not of a fiery leftist who learns to become a logical liberal. It's of a kid's continuous submergence into the culture she hates beaten into thinking it's not as bad as she thought. After school's out, Caitlin does just what Joey predicted she'd do. She becomes famous. As an international journalist, no less. And of course she does. In spite of her countless crusades and her most well-meaning of attentions, she falls in line, just like the rest of us. Kathleen shows a somewhat typical archetype of a character, that being the empathetic bully, the asshole of the group. But you kind of forgive them for being an asshole because they've gone through some serious stuff. However, this archetype is normally kind of superficial or surface level. But unlike those characters, she finds herself much more developed and fleshed out. Given that pretty much everyone she's ever loved has treated her terribly despite the care she shows for them and the chances she repeatedly gives them, like her mom and her ex, you can completely see where her bitterness and shrewd nature come from. Whenever she does show true love and compassion, she's met with pain. Even with her best friend Melanie, she's betrayed and hurt in a very deep way. While she forgives her and the two reconcile, it's yet another moment that showcases that consistent cycle of abuse Kathleen has grown accustomed to. Because while she has been a real ass towards Melanie in the past, this was a moment of bonding and of trust gone awry. Especially worsened as she was seemingly in the midst of a panic attack brought on by Weed. Kathleen as a character can be hard to root for at times, given her uptight and generally snarky nature, but what she experiences is downright disturbing. While her character's story does end up on a somewhat happy note, or rather more bittersweet, she's been traumatized and scarred as a result of situations where she gives people she loves chances. And sadly, that's a story that can be all too common for young people. Arthur and Yik are interesting. 
They start the show as very central and important players, however, by the last couple seasons, they are essentially benched, acting as purely supporting background characters. And what's intriguing is that this works in a unique sort of thematic cohesion, and that the more the two grow apart, the less screen time each one gets. In earlier seasons, they're the best of friends and get quite a bit of airtime, being in almost every episode of the first two seasons and a hefty amount of season three. However, once they get to high school, they begin to grow apart, and a lot of this is due to Arthur suddenly becoming rich. Yick has consistently dealt with poverty and low income his whole life, so seeing his best friend, who was already not too bad off, miraculously come into so much money for no apparent reason beyond dumb luck, who could blame the guy for getting bitter? Especially since Arthur starts to act a bit high and mighty, but can't stand anyone pointing out that he's rich. Naturally, he stays in a sort of goody two-shoes dorky role. What's with the hat? It's a beret. Makes you look like a nerd. It does not. Everyone in France wears one. While Yick becomes friends with Luke and begins smoking, drinking, and doing drugs. All things Arthur avoids. We leave the two forever on the lukewarm note of Arthur hustling Yick and his friends just to prove he can be as cool as them. By the end of the show, the most impactful emotional beats of their dynamic end up being awkward, longing glances. The last we hear of Yick is that he smokes weed all the time with Luke, and Arthur kind of just disappears. I can only assume he, I don't know, went off to France to go wear berets or some shit. No wheels, my boy. Perhaps my personal favorite among group, Wheels is one of the most terrifyingly real and raw characters in, fuck it, TV history. Never owning up to his mistakes and always blaming others for his problems, his signature phrase seems to be, it wasn't my fault, even at the end. Yeah, he did have a hard life, kind of a brutal one to be honest. In a vacuum, each one of his actions seemed defensible, at least prior to school's out, but the problem is he never learned anything from his mistakes. You can always find something to blame, but if you don't acknowledge the part you play, you'll never grow. And, of course, there's something to be said about the tragedy of Neil Hope, the actor who played Wheels. The character's story was often inspired by the actor's real life, perhaps more so than any other actor-character combo on the show. Although, it's important to note that Wheels and Neil are in fact two very different people with two very different lives. Hope grew up a boy in a hostile household with alcoholic parents who took most of the money Hope earned through his acting roles to feed their addiction. And he grew into a man filled with regret, a man who swore he needed at least one or two more years to mature and continue acting with the rest of Degrassi proper to have truly blossomed into a responsible talent, but it was not to be. Neil found himself stuck to everyday jobs, still clinging to some speck of hope that remained in his teenage years, lost in Degrassi. Hope would die in 2007 alone in his apartment. His family and friends would not find out until five years later. Degrassi may have tried to teach us that there can be a lesson to be learned in any moment no matter how mundane or tragic, but... Perhaps Neil's death taught us only that sometimes the great human drama can be a cruel and unfair one, even to some of its brightest stars. Sadly, it's a lesson we never needed to learn, one that's been continually taught over and over and over. It's a dark show, especially for what's essentially just a serialized after-school special, but the fact that it is serialized makes all its lessons stronger feels fresh. The result of seeing these characters evolve and change through those after-school lessons it makes it easier to see yourself in the kids' shoes. One of the show's biggest strengths is how accurately they portray the sense of seeing an old friend and knowing things will never be the same. Joey with Snake at the end of School's Out, Arthur and Yick in the final season, hell, even Kathleen and Melanie's final moments together ring more true of that lost feeling than it does of a powerful bond. And this isn't just another aspect of the show that works. That feeling is an essential and ironically often forgotten, pivotal emotion in high school. It's the time in your life when you make and lose more friends than at any other. Except maybe college. I don't know. Dep depends on how big of a school each one is, I guess. There may be hundreds of movies and shows that focus on kids in middle or high school, but Grassy High is the only one that really nails that feeling in a way that just feels like a punch to the gut. I mentioned before that the show's initial grab for me, its rotating cast that sees main, side, and background characters all in the same vein and treats them as equals, was incredibly unique, which it is. But while watching the show, it strangely reminded me of the classic novel War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. And while surely they are two completely separate stories in two very different mediums, Degrassi's kaleidoscopic take on character-driven storytelling brought to mind memories of hearing smart people talk about War and Peace. And I thought to myself, well, hey now, there just might be something here that no one else has thought about. What if, heck, 
What if Degrassi Junior High was Canada's war and peace, and nobody realized it? So, with such an ambitious, personal, and indubitably preposterous concept, I of course asked myself, should I embark on this grand and epic quest to read all of War and Peace and dare compare its style, theme, and form to silly old Degrassi High just for a YouTube video? By golly, that's a tall task, but it sounds like a perfect one for my friend Moss, co-producer and co-creator of these videos. So, Moss, is Degrassi High Canada's War and Peace? No. R really? Yeah. <sighs> anyway, one of the show's other strengths is how its characters mirror the story. But, death of a salesman. Arthur Miller's 1949 play is about, spoiler alert, the death of traveling salesman Willie Loman. The play takes place in his last 24 hours while illuminating motivations and themes throughout his flashbacks. Willie's primary concern is his adult son Biff, an unemployed loser who refuses to follow in Willie's footsteps. Biff grew up idolizing his overworked father until the cracks in Willie's life appeared before him. Biff in turn breaks away from that fantasy land that Willie created. He sees that he wouldn't be able to manifest that impossible life his father believes he could. Instead, Biff would rather work at a ranch out west, longing to correct what he sees as his father's mistakes. Willie is defined by his wants, money, respect, and for his sons to end up one rung above him. But there's no hope for Biff succeeding in those dreams, as he sees how cruel his life would inevitably be and rejects the path that his father set for him. In Degrassi, the children also bear witness to their parents' misery. The parents often cheat, drink, and lie in response to life's misfortunes. Their old dreams withered away, replaced by a shitty mortgage and an even shittier boss. Like Willie Loman, they intertwine their dead dreams with their children, fully trusting that their kids can become what they aspire to be, refusing to believe their failures to be a part of that system. But the kids aren't stupid. They see the pain their parents carry. They all dream big. Joey believes the band will take off. Alexa dreams of her perfect wedding with Simon. Michelle knows that living with her father will hurt her, so she moves out. <sighs> Yet, their dreams are also just that. Dreams. Will Caitlin become a big investigative journalist? Will Lucy become a famous filmmaker? Will Spike get the romance she so desperately craves? School's Out certainly seems to paint a dark picture. At first, Wheels has a clear vision for his future, but by the end he commits manslaughter, making his comparatively small dream of driving out west nothing but dust. And Joey's failed proposal to Caitlin prompts months of cheating on her, destroying the relationship. Okay, I feel like this has to be said. I don't think these two are honestly that deeply connected. That being said, Death of a Salesman does use generational conflict to inspect the American dream. The American dream is a toxic cycle where Willie is waiting for his father to come home and his son to become him. He is unable to see his own failure in life as anything more than an accident. After all, he followed all the rules, didn't he? How can he expect his own son to get even a fraction of that ideal life without following a single one? How can Joey expect an ideal life when all his energy is poured into his musical pipe dreams? How can Alexa and Simon expect an ideal life when married at 18? How can Michelle expect an ideal life when she's defying her racist father's wishes by dating BLT? In Degrassi, the point was not to criticize the American dream, but rather to be a realistic depiction of middle high school life. What could be more typical high school than parents forcing kids down paths they don't want? Now, don't get me wrong. That's kind of just the parent's job, in reality. Guiding kids away from danger is an important part of society. Someone should be helping Wheels get his act together. Unfortunately, under a capitalist system such as the one in 1940s America, 1980s Canada, or 2020s Canada and the United States, of course any good parent would want their child to assimilate into the system. When the other options tend towards starvation, why not take just a little poison if it keeps you alive? If a child's survival depends on their ability to work in the system, then by all means, feed them to the machinations of American industry. Because after all, maybe the American dream is just a place you can kick the can into someone else's road. <sighs> Pardon the yogurt team. TLDR in Death of a Salesman, The American Dream is framed through generational conflict, and Degrassi's realistic portrayals of parent-child struggles creates a palpable kinship. So there we have it. Degrassi, Canada's War and Peace. <sighs> I mean, death of a salesman. Degrassi tends to focus on topical and worldly issues, or 
At least it tries to. Whether that be AIDS, racism, or even video games. Never shying away from hot-button topics, Degrassi explores a world not so different from our own, as Joey's dreams of rock stardom and get-rich-quick schemes mirror Americans of the era, just as Caitlin's journey through climate change awareness and progressive values mirrors Canada's own. Except it doesn't. Those images of the United States and Canada are what they market and brand themselves as. If Joey's arc were to truly match America's, he would realize that Wall Street bankers get twice the amount of money, sex, and power that a rock star would. And triple the coke. The United States' increased obsession with obscene displays of wealth alongside decadent drug field partying in the 80s was no coincidence, as decades of so-called capitalistic ingenuity reached a fever pitch. After the end of the Cold War, America found itself with puppet state after puppet state, nothing more to do but be glorified colonies. Often when these countries would find themselves in a state of peril that the United States could certainly lend a hand with, they'd simply be ignored, just how Reagan's administration ignored the plight of the LGBTQ community during the AIDS pandemic. That is, until straight people started dying. But that's just the tip of the Ronald Reagan shitberg. However, I don't have the energy and you don't have the time to go over all that, so here's this. Pause it if you want. Later in the early 90s, we got the Iraq War. The first one. <sighs> Fitting into the American ethos, a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed George Bush got a bit oil-hungry and committed some war crimes. What can you do? To make it even better, Mr. President and his goon sanctions on Iraq would eventually kill over half a million Iraqi children, a tragedy that, according to former Secretary of State under the Clinton administration, Madeleine Albright, was, and I quote, worth it. But that's not who America said they were, is it? Don't worry, though. You're not alone. If Caitlin were really Canada's poster child, her most pressing concerns would revolve around keeping up her activist appearance. Meanwhile, her true intentions would feast on something much darker. Behind Canada's innocent bleeding heart veneer lies the cold reality of a first world nation state. The apparent concessions made to appease French separatists in the 80s were nothing more than minor aesthetic differences to make them feel like they won while changing nothing, like a red herring toward the proud Canadian ideal of multiculturalism. One of Trudeau's claims to fame was his National Energy Program, deemed an economic success and a precursor to the progressive Montreal Protocol. In reality, it hardly helped the country's oil problems and put intense strain on the western half of the country. It was also an ecological disaster as they plundered the Canadian countryside in a frantic search for oil, scarring it with new pipelines. Although, Canada's proposed Montreal Protocol was in fact a major success in establishing a framework that would later take the form of the oft-mentioned Kyoto Protocol. When Montreal was signed, Canada was seen as a leading power in the new world of green energy. However, by the time they backed out of Kyoto in 2011, despite the goal of the international treaty being to reduce emissions 6% by 2012, which wouldn't even make that much of a difference anyway, their emissions had actually skyrocketed by 30%. Degrassi is obviously less concerned with complex political navigation and failures of the country the show takes place in. It's all about the kids. In school, they're taught what is important and what is right, and despite some minor butting of heads between a teacher and a student every so often, for the most part, the adults that work at the school are portrayed as the most responsible ones on the show. But one of Degrassi's most present themes is that of adult mishandling children. Why are teachers in public school education exceptions to that rule? Well, it's certainly not the responsibility of the show to display the failings of modern education, along with the propaganda and purposeful withholding of information that permeates government-mandated teaching styles and subjects. These governments and systems choose for the kids what is important to remember. But as Degrassi teaches us, children and teens can be exceptional individuals with stronger moral compasses than, quite frankly, most adults. After all, the most pressing controversies of the time, climate change, the AIDS crisis, racism, are issues manufactured by the generations that preceded the kids of Degrassi, the same generations who decide how kids will remember the past. But maybe that's the wrong way to go about it. Oftentimes we are told by teachers that it's important to learn history in order to not repeat the mistakes of the past. But what happens when the lead up to the tragedy is cut to make someone or somewhere look better? How can we learn from a mistake we can't remember? And what about ongoing mistakes? We don't learn about the follies of our current world in school, we learn it from the news. History's blind spot tends to be that of the globe's recent memories. Did you learn about the Iraq war in school? Did you learn about the 2008 crash? The gap between now and what is deemed history creates a disconnect that allows us to believe the mistakes of the past don't exist in the current world. In 1876, under the Indian Act, Canada established a system of residential schools to commit genocide against their native population. These schools worked on half-day systems where children spent half the school day learning and the remainder doing forced manual labor. This was due to the underfunded nature of the residential school system. The MO of these schools was to unabashedly destroy the native culture and keep Native Americans out of anything other than manual labor type jobs. The last residential school closed in 1996. Now, my goal is not to be an educator here, so I'd like to encourage you to do your own research. Fair warning though, there is a lot of really dark and disturbing stuff to read and learn about regarding these schools, so perhaps keep at a pace you feel is appropriate when doing research. The general rule of thumb is whatever government wants you to forget, that's exactly what should be remembered. 
The attempts to sweep the residential school system under the rug through 1996 were only possible because nobody paid attention. This over 100 year long genocide happened before, during, and after Degrassi's original run. It's likely some of you were even alive during it. We live in a world where it can be hard to believe a country like Canada or the United States could commit such atrocities, but we did, and we still do, and we will continue to if things stay the same. But the most beautiful part of the internet age is you can choose what to remember and what to forget. Please don't choose to forget this. For a group of people so often maligned for being silly, for being overdramatic, for being just too darn hyperbolic, acting as if the world is ending over every little mishap that may come up in their lives. When the world really is ending, what's so wrong with that? We're already a species built on listening to the hyperboles of the world and shutting our eyes and ears off to whatever we deem too inconvenient to see or hear. It's these inconveniences that teens often find themselves perplexed with. How did we, for such modernized peoples, let the world fall into such disarray, into such a lack of empathy? Rather than answer this question, most older generations simply laugh off these humdrum complaints, disregarding them as they come from bleeding heart youths. Once they're older, they'll understand. That's just the way the world works. You see, whether by choice or through a sloven process of steady yet all the same exponential numbness, your parents, your grandparents, hell, your teachers, your bosses, they become desensitized to tragedy. A civilian bombing, a mistreatment of a governing body's people, a genocide. These are all just another part of everyday life. Shocking for a moment, and soon forgotten. And who could blame them? You can only see so many horrific travesties that you soon start to understand. You cannot stop this. A fundamental disconnect between older and younger generations has essentially always come down to this numbness, and the question of if it's your responsibility to do something about whatever terrifying thing you just saw or heard about. While the more youthful take on things is undoubtedly more endearing, it's often not so simple. And the complexity doesn't come from a complicated variety of political, cultural, economic, and so on factors that simply results in an inability for any one person to make a difference. It comes from someone above you and someone older than you, simply either not caring enough or rather actively profiting off of or even enjoying the abuse you so badly want to stop. Despite all that the internet has done to make younger people more educated, more free, it's this endless cycle of permitted ineptitude enabled simply by a generation of old folks who have grown tired and their most empathetic senses have dulled from decades of watching the world continue to chug along despite all that's happened. Maybe burning, but only in some kind of ghostly fire. Because after all, it will stay unchanged all the same, won't it? Therein lies an ensuing selfishness that deprives a new generation of a certain element of evolution. Because how dare your sons and daughters and children have it easier than you? You suffered so much, and so they should too. And only through that suffering will they understand how silly they are for caring about something. What was it again? Oh, right. Important. Let the world do its job. Make your money. Make your babies. And come back to the ground and watch from afar as you'll soon find out that nothing really matters. But what a twist. Things do matter. Our way of living has already proven unsustainable. And we far passed the point of no return. We continuously missed all of our deadlines. Our planet is dying at an exponential rate, and people keep getting hurt for stupid reasons all the same despite our so-called technological and socially aware advances. We've run out of time to fix things, and we'll hit a breaking point where we'll have to accept these changes that seem so far-fetched, else we'll go kaput. And why? Because meat tastes good, and it's too inconvenient to stop eating it. Because electric cars are lame, and it's too inconvenient to start driving them. And even so, the electricity used still comes from fossil fuels. Because XYZ makes me money, and I can't afford to stop making it. Or, at least, I don't want to. Because my life is unsustainable, and it's too inconvenient for me to change it. Because at the end of the day, for all we like to believe in how much we care for our children and how much we want the next generation to take the great leap forward, most of you, deep down, would trade it all to keep everything exactly the goddamn same. Life has slowly warped into revolving around comfort, how much value we place on it, and how badly we want to keep it. Because if you close your eyes hard enough, whatever scares you isn't real anymore. And that belief will always exist. And that belief will kill us. Hell, 
It already has thousands and thousands of times over. And look, at this point, I know you're probably thinking, what in the hell does this have to do with Degrassi? Well, long story short, in the immortal words of Wheel Snake and Joey Jeremiah, everybody wants something they'll never give up. Everybody wants something they'll take your money and never give up. But with the advent of the internet, a new age of people has come to the forefront. The first generation who can choose how to remember and how to forget. A generation that has learned to educate itself. Young people, more than ever before, have passionately been decrying the transgressions of the world, unafraid to criticize even their own countries and their own families. And while loyalty has always been a highly valued aspect of humanity, a loyalty to country and heritage has now been replaced by a loyalty to the human race. Every single part of it. And I'm proud to be a part of that. Degrassi, while flawed, does inspire hope for the youth. And while yes, it's often depressing, it's also filled with joyous and hilarious moments throughout. And it doesn't feel like such a buzzkill when it's playing on the TV. And in celebration of that, Moss and I would like to both share our favorite moment from the show. It wasn't one of the characters we focused on, but my favorite moment of the show belongs to Snake, as well as Spike. Throughout the show, Snake has proven to be a character with a good heart, and no moment displays this more than my favorite. At the beginning of the 12th episode of the last season, Snake and Spike are studying together for class when Snake picks up Emma and plays with her, immediately showing his soon-to-be-discovered paternal instincts, which pop up later in the next generation. Speaking of that show, what makes the moment even more beautiful is that this is Snake's first moment with Emma, someone who will later become his stepdaughter many years down the line. And their dynamic and relationship is an incredibly strong one. It all starts in this adorable moment. For me, the show kind of peaks in its final episode. Uh, when at prom, Joey convinces Dwayne to go back out to the dance floor. Dwayne was scared of facing everyone since the school had found out he was HIV positive. Uh, that moment in the bathroom where all the bullshit of high school melts away and they don't need to keep fighting, <laughs> allowing Joey to be, like, kind, is that final piece that makes this masterpiece complete. Their history was always rough, but in this moment you get to see how much Joey has grown. You know, he's not that kid who shoved Arthur in a locker and called Dwayne a monkey. Joey has a maturity that's fully bubbled to the front at that point. Just something I liked, I guess. Shout out Bartholomew Bond. Hello. Uh, just want to come in here last second and say thank you so much for watching our video. It took a lot of time and effort. And um, we also want to give a huge thank you and shout out to Lily Trefilio, who let us use a bunch of her music from her Tiger Lily project, which you can find on SoundCloud. I have links to all her stuff in the description. Uh, I'm a huge fan, and, and uh, you should be too. <laughs> um, and as well, we also want to give a huge thank you to Charlie Lubeck uh, for letting us, uh, or lending us uh, some of his voice talents for uh, the video, just a little bit. You may have noticed it. Um, and also, if you like the video, maybe give it a like, or if you're feeling frisky, subscribe. Um, we got some stuff cooking up soon, and we think you're going to really enjoy it, maybe, hopefully. Uh, yeah, well, bye.